students in the remotely piloted aircraft facility at Holloman Air Force Base in Alamogordo are training with two different unmanned aircrafts or drones, the MQ-1 Predator and the more powerful MQ-9 Reaper, but not before racking up hours and hours of training on simulators doing virtual missions. This vehicle here, it's obviously pulled up and there's a, a, another guy and a, and a, a bit of armour. So, of course this is a simulation and how we would train here at Holloman is we would just get the pilot and the sensor operator to keep track of the vehicle at all times and report anything suspicious. That's Sean. He can't share his last name because of security reasons. He came to Holloman on exchange from the British Armed Forces to train drone pilots. In Great Britain, he was operating weapon systems on manned aircraft. I used to deploy quite a lot and uh, our job was maritime surveillance and we would uh, track submarines. I also did uh, overland missions. But Sean doesn't man aircraft anymore and he's now part of the 49th wing. He says the shift to remote piloted aircraft hasn't been that big of an adjustment. The only difference uh, than doing what I used to do and doing this job is uh, is the geographical location and the fact that we are sat here at 1G. Everything else is uh, practically identical. Training Squadron Commander Lieutenant Kelvin Powell says drones are taking Air Force capability above and beyond anything possible using conventional aeroplanes. Because you're removing the human entity uh, from the aircraft, you no longer have to worry about caring for that individual. And so what it allows us to do is keep our airplanes airborne for much longer periods of time. The average missions are anywhere from 15 to 24 hours. In that time period, and because you're able to stay airborne, it gives what we could refer to as the unblinking eye on a target potentially. And so you are able to track uh, a target for a much longer period of time without uh, potentially losing that target ever in that, in that amount of time. Trainer Sean says surveillance is the main mission for drones, but he says being on the ground with ease of access to intelligence and communication means when weapon systems do have to be used, shots are only taken after rigorous consideration from commanders with full awareness of what's around the target. All the other tools that we have to aid the mission, we can just pick up the phone, we can use the instant messages, we can speak directly to our intelligence uh, staff, Hal says for pilots and drone operators, the shift is as much psychological as it is geographic. He says taking pilots and operators out of the heat of battle allows every single use of force to be deliberate and precise, ultimately minimising civilian deaths and collateral damage. It is definitely a, a benefit of being able to stay on station, watch the target develop the awareness around the target, uh, to minimise those uh, collateral effects. But critics and human rights groups say these same technological capabilities have paved the way for civilian deaths that won't be accounted for. Currently, the White House doesn't have to reveal the number of casualties from covert US drone strikes. A Senate bill introduced in May this year would change that and require the number of people killed or injured by covert US drone strikes to be made public. Powell acknowledges that there is room for human errors, but says civilian deaths are in nobody's interest. We are very aware that uh, civilian casualties in war have a tremendous uh, adverse strategic effect on our operations. Uh, and so we do everything that we are, is absolutely within our power to minimize that. Uh, and I believe RPAs uh, are much, uh, have great opportunity to enhance that. Powell says the demand and need for drone operators is ongoing. And so is the controversy about this new era of warfare. For KRWG, I'm Simon Thompson.